Are you finally starting to take your music production and songwriting seriously? Do you think that you have what it takes to make a living in the music industry? Well, this marketing podcast is there to help music producers and artists to begin building a foundation to grow their music company from the bedroom to the boardroom. And now, here's your host, Brennan Lunen. What's up, guys? Brennan Lunen here at EQ Productions doing my music marketing podcast. This week is episode eight, and today I wanted to talk to you guys about music promotion and marketing. Now, if you're in the music industry, which some of you are and some of you are not, and I only say that because there's a huge difference between a musician and a music professional. One is you're in the bedroom making beats or you're playing your guitar. The other is you're you know, reaching out to potential customers and you're, you're making deals and you're profiting from the music industry. Now, the key word here is profiting. I understand a lot of people who make beats. They could be really good. They have talent. They have skill. They know what they're doing. But if you ask them how much money they made last year off of music, you know, you get excuses or you get, well, I don't know, or you get, you know, a bunch of BS that kind of, doesn't answer the question, doesn't necessarily put them in the category. So, you know, I do this podcast to kind of educate you guys about what's going on in the music industry, you know, what's going on in the marketing field and the marketing world. And I want to share these ideas with you guys because I want to see people win and succeed, right? I don't necessarily care for, you know, some of the tactics being used online. And I always talk about it, you know, the, the inbox spamming or, you know, tagging 99 friends on Facebook or, you know, sending out a bunch of BS to, 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 you know, kind of annoy the potential listener and annoy the people that are possibly doing something else and don't necessarily, you know, want to be distracted by these, you know, incoming messages or, 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 you know, whether it's instant message or whether it's, you know, or direct message rather or, um, or emails or anything. So these people basically, they don't want to hear from you until they're ready to hear from you. So you have to kind of understand that you know, in this world, there's the 80-20 rule, of course, the 80 being, you know, 80% of your posts have to be entertaining. They can't all be, you know, shop talk, and they can't all, you know, have sales pitches in them. A lot of them have to keep people entertained so they, they keep paying attention to you. And then the 20%, you throw in the, the sales pitches, the, you know, educational stuff, you know, the, the boring stuff that people don't necessarily want to see, but will look at it because, You know, they're either trying to support you or they believe in what you're doing and blah, blah, blah. So there's, you know, there's that finesse in the marketing world that you can't just, you know, you can't approach somebody and just throw your information at them. Or you can't hit somebody up on Facebook and without talking to them, without having that first initial introduction where, you know, you introduce yourself as such and such and thank the other person for taking the time and maybe not necessarily push any projects on them or or songs or whatever you have, merch, whatever you have, wait for the right time to ask the person to, you know, review your product, listen to your music. There's, there's that level of finesse that has to go into your marketing because too much marketing could be perceived as annoying, too little marketing and nobody will remember. So you have to walk a fine line where not only do you introduce new material on a, on a regular base, so in television, they call it programming. And the reason that they call it programming is because every week when a TV programming director puts together the schedule, they do it so people know that every week they could catch their shows. At a certain time, they could plan around it. There's consistency in it. And the consistency is super important because if your audience gets the content from you at just different intervals, eventually they're just going to tune out. They're not going to care anymore because they want that consistency from you. They want to get content from you every week or every month and know that it's coming at that level of consistency so they become kind of attached to you and and you become their go-to guy for the specific content and so what i notice is a lot of people are just kind of ignoring all that maybe they don't know and i'm going to assume that they don't you know the content just gets kind of blasted out at random intervals there's no consistency there's no flow of content that kind of introduces you to to, you know, content A and then walks you through to content Z where you feel some type of cohesion and you feel continuity, but it's just random content. And I'm guilty of that too. And I'm not saying that, you know, anything I say here is just educational. This is not necessarily meant to judge anybody. And it's also not saying that I do any of these things perfectly myself. You know, I'm just like you. I'm always trying to learn and grow and, and, and make myself better. But 
yeah, I care enough to, to do the research and to figure this stuff out because I want my customers to have the best possible experience, right? And so every interaction that you have with your customer is a potential sale. Even though you might, you might not always sell them, you're going to be doing something in a way of promotion where they will think of you or they will accept your emails and open them or they will check your posts when you post it on social. You have to be conscious of that and not to piss them off way in advance and kind of lose that opportunity that they might present to you by allowing you to, you know, send emails to them. And I say allowing you because that's what it is. I mean, it's a privilege to gain somebody's email address. Not to say that, you know, an email address is going to make you rich or not, but what's really happening is somebody's telling you, I'm interested in you and I want to hear from you. But don't abuse the privilege because that privilege also could be taken away. And then when it gets taken away, it could come with some, you know, repercussions like you being banned from your email client provider, um, you know, for abusing their policies, or if people keep sending you into the spam box, you're going to be considered a spammer because, you know, the email filters look at this stuff and they say, okay, well, this guy sent out 15,000 emails last month and 12,000 of them got sent to, to, to spam. So what does that say about the sender, right? So you may want to consider your approach. And just like any other business, I mean, folks, listen, don't consider your your music production company anything other than a small business, you know, or depending on what size production company you have. It's a business like every other. It has the same needs. It needs resources. It needs time. It needs effort and you have to treat it like a business because a lot of people will just take their music production company and say, Oh, you know, I make beats. I don't have to like adhere to any kind of advertising policies or have any kind of consistency. I do what I want. And there's this like narcissistic notion that just because you make a beat, somebody's going to listen to it. It's the farthest thing from the truth. When I first started producing AOL was big. So we were using instant messenger. So, you know, we were doing the same things that a lot of kids are doing these days. We were just sending people on solicited stuff. Like, you know, sending people MP3s or whatever without asking, without permission, without anything. And that's just, it's annoying. And growing up and, and learning the marketing and, and the advertising side of things, you really start to notice that the things that you used to do and the kind of impact that they have on you, because I see a lot of people doing a lot of the same stuff I did coming up. And I get angry about it. And I only get angry about it because it, it makes me realize the stuff that I did was really just making people annoyed and it wasn't doing anything. And I could honestly tell you that all the stuff that I did as far as, you know, spam, you know, posting or, or, or spam messaging people, it never led anywhere. I mean, I never got any kind of, you know, any kind of success out of it. No a and ever called me, even though I, I had a whole list of record labels. You know, I bought one of those. You know, I was desperate, and I bought one of those lists that had industry contacts, the biggest load of bullshit, and you're sending these people emails, and they're never even being answered. Nobody gets back to you, and you think you're going to get a response, but never does, so you get kind of discouraged, and just leads down this whole path of being, you know, being uncertain about your future and not knowing whether or not you should pursue this, and, you know, it just becomes one of those things, like, like an artist doesn't go through enough crap in their day anyway to deal with this. It's just... You know, it's too much and it's also unnecessary. So in doing my research and just preparing for this weekly podcast like I do, I wanted to talk tips to promote your music because it's really essential for any musician that's looking to make music into a career and actually make money off of it and get out of your mom's basement, get out of your bedrooms, actually hit the road and, you know, do projects with big businesses or work with, you know, famous artists or whatever it is you want to do in your career. You have to do certain things and take certain steps to get to that level. You know, actually today I was on Facebook and somebody tagged me in a post and I appreciate the tag. And what the post was really about was somebody who was asking for management, promotion, and any kind of advertising, I believe. And what they were talking about is they were, they were looking for a manager for their career, somebody that was going to you know, help get opportunities and help build the, you know, foundation for their career, speaking with a lot of industry professionals, including management, that anybody that is a real manager, like somebody that's actually going to know how to manage your career, 
is not going to manage a rookie. And I say this with all due respect to people just starting out, but you got to you got to reason it out this way. If a manager works off a commission, it could be anywhere between 12% all the way up to 20. That means that this manager is going to be looking to make money while making you money. Now, if you're a famous artist or if you're an established artist rather and you do make a living, yes, it makes sense for a big manager or just even a professional manager who knows what they're doing is successful. It makes sense for them to take you on as a client because you're generating income already. There's a stream of revenue coming in and you're, you're able to compensate them for doing their work. Now, as opposed to somebody who's just a rookie starting out, I mean, look at the playing field here. I mean, you got somebody who's starting out. They don't have a fan base. They don't have any kind of track record. They haven't generated any revenue so far. And they just really pose no kind of interest to somebody who is doing shows and they're on tour or, you know, they're selling merch and they're selling music and they're obviously pulling money in, which makes it lucrative for somebody like a music manager to actually take you on and, and manage you. A lot of the things that I read in that post kind of led me to think that this guy was, you know, probably super talented. I, that's not even, you know, in the, the realm of what I was concerned about, but Again, they were looking for management. And I almost I almost feel like you never look for management. So I'm on the completely opposite side of the spectrum because I think, like, you never look for management. You don't go out of your way to find it because if you do, you're probably going to land on some kind of a rookie or a hack, somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, doesn't have any clout in the industry, doesn't have any pull, isn't going to be able to break down doors for you and get you into, you know, good situations or make great deals for you or actually get you income. Now, what is going to happen is you're going to have somebody who's going to be a rookie, not knowledgeable about what's going on in the industry because they're not experienced enough. And this person is going to be kind of roaming around the industry with your name in their mouth. And they're going to basically ruin your reputation before you had, before you even had a chance to be heard. And really the reason that I feel that a lot of people get a manager or try to get a manager a lot of these managers end up being hacks is because one the artist himself doesn't know and doesn't want to learn how to advertise and market themselves which i understand it's a lot of work it took me years to just be like okay not great but okay i feel that most people don't want to take that route and learn the advertising the marketing they don't want to learn the publishing, the legal. They don't want to learn anything to do with the actual music industry and contracts and blah, blah, blah. So they want to kind of pawn that off on their manager, who then supposedly will do all this work for them so they could sit in the studio and make beats, rap, whatever, smoke weed, drink, chill with girls. Look, I get it. We all want that life. We all want to just be you know, famous for nothing and just make millions just chilling. But that's not how it works. And most people that will become your manager will become your manager. And most likely, you know, if you are seeing success, they'll fuck it up. They'll ruin it. And, you know, I've known managers like this, people's cousins who became their manager, who just run around in the club and just tell chicks, oh, I'm such and such manager. But all they're doing is just using your name to get laid. So, you know, again, and I want to thank these dudes for you know, give me the idea to kind of include this in my podcast this week. But it's really important to understand that this stuff you have to do yourself because you have to know how all this stuff works. Because if you don't, what's going to happen is the person that's going to come in and tell you how it works is not going to have your best interest in mind. And what that leads to is if you don't understand how a project actually breaks down and what it takes, you're at the mercy of this person telling you, Hey, you know, it's going to take blah, 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 and it's going to take this much money, and it's going to require this, this, and that. And if you have no idea what he just told you, or if you have no idea how to actually verify any of it, you have two options. You're either going to say, no, I don't know, and just kind of walk away, missing an opportunity, or you're going to say, yeah, and you're going to let this person, you know, play with your future, and more than likely, you will see that that person will take advantage of you. So... Learn marketing, learn advertising as much as you could. Read books, you know, watch videos. And I'm not talking about watching Gary Vee. You know, much respect. And I talk about Gary Vee in a few last episodes. But just understand that 
there's a difference between watching free content that somebody kind of gives you to energize you and motivate you and really for them suck you into their funnel and then feed you through the steps until they get you to buy something. You know, there's a difference between that and actually going to take a course or watching a real tutorial online designed to educate you on how to do X, Y, and Z. So make sure that when you're watching these marketing videos, that they're not just hyping you up and get you excited about whatever event they're going to be at or, you know, how it's important to grind and hustle and, you know, all that jazz. So make sure that you understand that music marketing is a beast all on its own. It's still marketing. It doesn't mean that you get to cut corners. It doesn't mean that people are going to give you, you know, they're going to give you passes for, for stuff that you do incorrectly. It's not going to happen. There's 280 million people in America. A good portion of them are musicians. Now, granted, a lot of them aren't trying to be famous, but you could get the numbers broken down far enough where you could see, as far as producers and artists go, there's plenty of us, and there's no shortage, which means that we're oversaturating the industry, which means the competition is fierce, which means that the people that are actually holding the keys and making the decisions, you know, leaves them with a lot of decisions to be made. In that world, you're just a small fish, and with a small fish doesn't come a whole lot of clout or pull or ability to kind of shape the environment around you the way you see fit. So you have to work outside the box. And even though sometimes you may not, sometimes you may do exactly what everyone does. You know, Nas have said it, there's nothing new under the sun. It's not what it is, it's how it's done. So that kind of goes to show you that you're probably not going to be a pioneer. And it's okay. I'm not. I don't do anything different than, you know, a lot of people, but it's just how I do it or it's the quality that I put out or the care that I put into it or the spin that I put on that makes it my own. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to create something from scratch. It may, you know, take something like, you know, you doing a remix of a song to make it famous. Who knows? The important thing is, is that you will do something and as long as you put your heart and your soul into it, you're going to get somewhere and you're going to, to make, you know, you're going to make some kind of an effort and success will come out of it because your heart's in it. And usually when your heart's in it, that's when the, the best things come out. So I wanted to kind of get into a few topics um, regarding music marketing and promotions to kind of give you an idea. And you can find a lot of this stuff on blogs and posts and stuff, but you know, since you're here listening, I actually want to give you some value. So there's a list of few things that I have that you guys could do, you know, to get your music out there and actually get a fan base because ultimately that's what it's all about. It's about building a fan base. So a great way to do that, and let's start off by saying a great way to build your fan base is and has always been live music. Now, a lot of you producers just stop and goes, hey, man, I'm a, you know, I'm a producer. How does that really, how do I do live music? Shit, man. I mean, just like any band packs their gear, takes it to a venue, sets up, does a mic check, and then does their show. That could be you. You know, we tend, as producers, we tend to give a mix CD to a DJ and expect them to play the music while, you know, we're standing in the crowd and watching the MC that we just worked with or whatever perform it with them in the background kind of giving them our spot and today with tools like the machine and having you know macbooks and everything's portable there's no reason why you shouldn't be up on that stage with your mc right there's no reason why you shouldn't be at that show you know swinging your dick around no pun intended you know just being like hey i produced that track here's my business card you know blah 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 Network with other people at the show. You know, before and after your set, you could have a merch table obviously set up that you could man. And if people see you on stage and then see you man in the merch table, they'll put two and two together and they'll actually benefit you in a way that you'll be able to sell merchandise just because people saw you rock. And immediately people have that kind of feeling that if they see a great act, you know, it's a great feeling to know that you're possibly one of your first people in your circle who saw this band or you discovered this, this singer or, or rapper or whatever. But even furthermore, the producer is getting so much clout right now that we're becoming sort of like DJs. And if we're missing that opportunity to go to the live show and parlay that 
actual experience with the fan because you know, we could do everything online. I could sit in this room that I'm in right now and I could record an entire album. I could do all the marketing. I could do all the video, do everything in this room and put it out. And that, in a sense, is like a performance, but there's nothing like actually being at a show and, and dealing with this, the, the, the singer, the rapper, the producer, the DJ, whoever. And people really care for that. And that builds that connection between you know, seeing the person that you listen to on your, you know, on your computer or, or on your iPhone or whatever you use, you know, listening to them and then seeing this person live, it kind of makes like a weird connection, weird bridge that you just, you know, you, know, you start to really like the artist because it's not just a song. I mean, because you, you've seen them and you really like them and now there's merchandise. So there's a lot of things that could happen from a live show that I feel gets overlooked and especially when a lot of these rappers, that I, especially around here in Connecticut where I live, and, you know, shout out to everybody grinding, but, you know, I'm always negative and I'm always hard on, on people in this industry because I want them to be better. And I feel that live shows are grossly underproduced. I feel like people show up late. I feel like people don't really care. I just feel like, you know, it's just a way for them to be on stage and have a few shots taken for social and then they're just out of there. They don't support any other act, you know, acts on, on the bill. They don't stick around long enough. They just, you know, and the promoter has an empty house because people just come and go. And so now you got to think from a promoter side, and the promoter's not really necessarily going to like you as an artist coming and going, taking your crew with you that you brought. You know, oh, yeah, I brought 10 people with me. Great, but you left as soon as you did your set. And again, I'm guilty of this too. And, uh, you know, and, and I apologize to anybody who I walked, you know, walked out on during their set or right before they came on, you know, because we were done. And so the older I get, the more I realize that little things that we do when we're not thinking really affect outcome of the future. So imagine, again, you're an artist, you're at a showcase, you came with 10 people, you left right after your set. Now the promoter is looking at you going like, OK, he shut up with 10 people. But those 10 people were in the building for about 20 minutes, not even. They bought one drink each. Cool. The bar made a couple hundred bucks from them. Cool. And then they left. Right? And then imagine there's three or four. So the bar makes a grand. Whoop-de-doo. Promoter makes, you know, whatever at the door. And nobody really sticks around and supports anybody. So what really is the purpose of the showcase? The promoter doesn't get paid, so he doesn't have a desire to do any more because it's a waste of his time. The bar doesn't get paid, so they don't even want to have this. And, you know, God forbid there's a fight or anything outside in the parking lot. Now you're bringing attention to the bar that they didn't want. And so what in the hell reason would a bar or any kind of club or any venue would have to, you know, deal with hip-hop and deal with with these types of shows? And people always complain there's nothing to do. Well, hey, if we could stop shooting at each other or start fighting with each other, you know, after these events would be great. And then we could all continue having these events to go to. Now, you want to go shoot at people on your own time? Great. But if I got to perform and you're shooting up the club and everybody's running crazy, you can understand how this thing affects all of us. So we're fueling all this shit. You know what I mean? Like, we are the pillars of this shit. So if we're not going to sit there and we're not going to dedicate our time and, and make it actually something worthwhile to go to, then what are we even trying to do this for? All the money that we make as musicians and artists primarily come from the road. So if you're not going to utilize the road correctly, you might as well just call yourself a hobbyist because you're not going to make money off streaming. You know, selling albums is out, so you're not really necessarily going to sell too many albums, especially not on the street. Live shows, folks. Make sure you're taking, you know, taking these things seriously. Make sure you're planning. Make sure you're doing some type of visual presentation instead of just showing up looking fly and just dancing around on stage. Try to think, you know, try to think a show. Try to put to put people in a situation where they feel like, wow, this is really interesting, as opposed to just like, wow, we got to hear a song that's really loud and it's, you know, not mixed by a, a legit sound guy and it doesn't have great speakers in the place to begin with. So the show itself has to be a show. So make sure when you do a live show, you do it right, guys, because, you know, it's either going to make you or it's going to break you. But I still recommend trying it. You're going to have a bunch of shitty shows eventually. You're going to have a great show and you're going to see the actual value in it and you're going to put a lot of energy into it because you'll notice bands that put on great stage shows get more shows because people like it and they want to come back and see them again. So that covers the live performance. So now we move on to 
the right way to use social media. Now, this is something I, I know pretty well. I use social media every day for work. You know, I run Facebook ads, help manage blogs, you know, work with email blasts and such. So, you know, I see my way around social media um, pretty much every day on a daily basis, eight hours a day, and then I come home and sometimes do it after work as well. Social media is often done wrong. Social media is, is used in ways that it's not really designed to be used in. And the problem with that is, is people start to create bad trends. And those trends pick up and they get spread because anything negative on the internet spreads like six times faster than anything positive. So I see social media get butchered. I constantly, and I feel like, Again, I feel like such a dick, but I tell people all the time, don't send me unsolicited links. The same way that record labels will tell you, we're not going to listen to your tape if you just send it in without telling us. That's what unsolicited is. I didn't ask for it. Why are you sending it to me and expecting me to listen and then give you a review and then you know spend the time and the effort and then feel bad if you don't like it? And Why? Why? You know, why would I put myself through it? So I immediately, you know, I I used to just be a dick about it, but now I kind of like laid off a little bit. I realized the error my way. And I just kind of tell, you know, tell these young producers or whoever's sending me anything. I'm like, listen, you know, I don't want to be a dick and blah, blah, blah. I just want you to know that this is a really annoying way of doing marketing. And I try to kind of give them a little tidbit without giving away, you know, the farm. And it's just... I don't know. I feel like social media is just, it's a conversation. You know, you talk to people. Sure, there's ads, but those ads work in conjunction with the algorithm that does a ton of calculation to figure out who's the right person to show this ad to. So you're not showing this ad to random, you know, random people that don't have anything to do with what you're trying to do. Even if they're in the realm of that, so if they're in the music business, there's a million careers they could have that have nothing to do with the with the music or your music or anybody's music. They might just be a you know a camera guy, but he works in the film industry. He might just this guy might just, you know, work in the mailroom at the record label, but he's in the music industry because that's what the industry is. So you just gotta understand who you're dealing with. And you can't spend your time dealing with the wrong person and then expect something out of it, you know what I mean? And continue to just continue to do the same kind of failed blueprint over and over again and expect something different to happen. Like that one person that just, oh, I just, it's not the approach. It's the person. It's not my fault. It's their fault. They're just, you know, they're, they're just not hearing me. You know what I mean? They have that attitude that like, I'll just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And it's not my fault. It's just the listener's fault. You know, well, it is always your fault. You're not going to make them listen to your song if they don't want to. And they're not going to want to listen to your song unless you make them like you. So you got to do something that either make them like you or hate you. They can't not care about you. Make sure that social media for you isn't done in a way that just uses it to sell people stuff. Like 100% of the time you're selling, selling, selling. You're giving people no entertainment value. You're just giving people straight sales pitches. Eventually, people are going to be like, dude, whatever. I don't care. Like, I don't I don't care, nor do I want to hear this, period. So use the ad platform for that type of thing more than you use the posting for pitches. Pay for your ads. Have Facebook show it to the right people instead of deciding to show, you know, whatever this, this video that you just made to, like, random dudes and their producers and you're a producer and you're just blasting out. You know, they're, you're wasting your time just sending emails and sending messages to people who just don't even fit the right customer persona for you. So, you know, with social media, like the way that I always recommend for artists to use social media is just be conversational and make it 80, 80 20 thing that I talked to you about before. 80% should be entertainment value, 20% should be marketing advertising. You don't want to beat people on the head with your marketing. It's not about how many times they see it, it's about, the impact it has, the emotional, you know, tug of strings that you put on it. And, you know, it's not about, oh, I want to show this to them 80 times and then the 81st time they're going to decide that, hey, you know what, I need it. 
That's definitely not how it works. You know, it's a complete opposite. You know, you want people to see it just, oh, what is that? Like, and then want to, like, pay you and buy your product or service, whatever you offer. So, with social media, it's kind of a delicate thing. You know, again, make it into a conversation before you just start randomly blasting out posts. Make it so it's more about providing value to your customer where the customer feels like they're coming to you and they're getting value of entertainment because that's the business we're in. We're in an entertainment business, so we have to provide entertainment to people looking to escape from their daily life. If your content's boring, they're going to be like, I'm just going to go elsewhere. And so you want to provide entertainment. You also want to make sure you're doing consistently because, again, like any kind of programming, people love programming. We like process. Processes are something that we just have in our mind. We like mazes. You know, we're like rats in a maze. We want to be kind of funneled through a process. It doesn't have to be a physical process, but people want to, like, know that this is step one, there's a step two, and I'm going to end up at the end, and I'm going to feel some type of accomplishment for going through this whole process. And so, you know, make people part of the process by giving them consistency and giving them quality content that they want to come back because, you know, your job as a content creator is to create content and you have to entertain people. So when you create content to entertain people, what basically happens is you're making it, you know, you're making it kind of part of their culture, whatever you want to call it, like their tradition, their culture to, to come see you. Right, we listen to the artists because of how they make us feel. So we go back to them over and over again if the album is dope. And so social media, like the way that it works, is by creating content that people want to digest and you know consume. You're basically giving them you know a, a point of entertainment, and as long as you're bringing that entertainment on a consistent level. They're going to keep coming back to you. So the more content you put out, the better your content, the more people are going to come and see it, the better you're going to have chances of selling them stuff over and over again. But then again, remember that as they're digesting your content, your content has that subtle sales pitch in it. When even it doesn't include one, you know, just showing, you know, just showing your fans that you're in the studio making a beat, recording yourself making a beat might sell beats for you because people see you make beats they get inspired they get you know excited and they're like that shit's dope i want that and they'll go and they'll come to you and when they come to you you know it's like you're a fisherman i always use, i love this analogy it's a fisherman you know standing on a you know on the on the shore with with the fishing rod and a bait and he's casting that bait and the fish you know eats the bait and it just gets hooked, and the fisherman reels it out. And so what that symbolized to me is, you know, you as a business owner having your customers, you know, a.k.a. the fish, not to call them a fish or whatever, but, you know, and you're throwing the right bait because there's the right bait for the certain type of fish. Certain type of fish like it, certain don't. If you want specific kind of, you know, catch, you want to use a specific bait. So as soon as you can figure out who your audience is, you know, aka what kind of fish they are, two, what kind of what kind of bait they prefer, you know, they could be giving away a song, it could be giving away special, you know, meet and greet, whatever it is that you do, whatever bait you put out there will attract a specific kind of customer. And if that customer meets the profile, then perfect. If not, you want want to you might want to check your bait and to see if you're putting the right bait out there, or if it's not catching anything. So again, use that analogy of, of social media being more of like a fishing expedition where you're obviously trying to bring home the biggest fish and you, I, you know, you got to use the right bait. You got to use the right, you know, the right equipment to get things done. So again, social media is really great for building relationships and really just nurturing them and following up and providing more content and giving people value. So that's what social media is really big. It's not really intended for, for us to sell 24 seven, although again, we could sell and make great money through it, make sure to use social media more as a conversational tool and less as a eBay because that's not really what it's here to do. All right. So let's move on to the next one. This one is going to be promoting and selling your music on your website. That's a great way to do music marketing because your website is a domain you control. Hopefully you control. If you're smart, you would control your domain. 
Your website is a place where you make the rules, control flow of traffic, make sure that, you know, things happen how you want it to happen. It's not like any of these platforms that you don't have any control over and all you could do is either participate a lot or not so much, but you don't have any physical control over it. And so the website gives you that control and it allows you to be the master of your domain and allows you to say what happens and what doesn't. Nobody could kick you off your own website. Hopefully, again, you don't break any laws or do anything super shady that could land you in actual legal trouble. As long as you don't break any policy of the company or you do anything illegal, you're the boss. That's the benefit of having your own website. Now, obviously, the drawback is you got to spend money to develop it. You got to put money behind the content. You got to put time and effort into it. But this is the best place to sell people stuff like Amazon and, and eBay, but your website, the reason that it's great to sell from is that if you could get people to come to your website using great content and linking it back to your site, if you could get people to come back, not only can you pixel them, which means you could put tracking information on them, so you could follow them around the internet and show them, and specifically them, your ads that get them to convert into buyers, you know, because once people come to your site and they spend some time, you could assume that they actually have interest in you. So having your own website and having that tracking information ever present on every page, seeing what people are doing, where they're going, how they're moving around your website, where the hotspots are, where people are clicking the most, you know, some content might need to be moved around from bottom of the page to top. So having your own website, this is where you would learn this stuff. Now, granted, a lot of, a lot of the big services give you some of this stuff. When they're ready to kick you off or they want to block you because something happened and you made a mistake or you did something brash and didn't think about it, they could block you. That means your entire audience is gone. One false move and you're done, you know? And so I don't say anything, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with using the platforms, but if you're not using those platforms as more kind of like an additional source, you know, of content distribution, and not your primary, you know, your primary home base of operations. It's fine. You could do that. Use every platform you can, however you could, as long as time obviously is, is allotted to it. And you use it, you know, use it to your advantage. And I, I don't see anything wrong with it. But do make sure you have a website. Because your website, again, is where you could collect email. You could get tracking data. You could sell people stuff. You don't have to pay necessarily a ton of, you know, membership fees except hosting. So having your own website is super important because you never want to let somebody else control the destiny of your business. Granted, you know, having hosting, you know, could obviously be a problem if somebody wants to shut you down. But then again, you could leave a host and you could go to a different, you know, website hosting and get whole different hosting and it's not a problem. As opposed to if you're on BeatStars and all your audience is on BeatStars and BeatStars finds a reason to ban you or block you and now your whole audience is gone. And you don't have them in an email list or whatever. You know, maybe you do, but maybe you don't. And if you don't, that whole audience is not accessible to you anymore. Where it wouldn't happen to you with a website. Where a website is in your control. And if somebody, let's say, hacked you, as long as you're smart and you do backups and you move them off site so they can't be corrupted, you're okay. Because then, you know, again, you could be hacked. You could have your whole website destroyed. But if you have a backup of, you know, yesterday's, state of your website, then you should be fine. Usually a lot of hosts will let you um, back up daily and they have cloud computing and so it just it works out great. But um, you want to make sure you have a website. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to drive home here is that you want to make sure you have a home base where it's not controlled by some other entity, some other business. My last point I wanted to make is, guys, make sure you have an email list. And you probably heard me talking about this, and I probably said this before, but there's three forms of traffic on the Internet. You have traffic that you own, traffic that you control, and traffic that you don't own or control. Now, traffic you own is email, traffic you control is advertising, and traffic you don't own or control is search. So if people are searching on Google, you have no control over it except you know, doing your search engine optimization on your website where you make your website easily readable to the Google crawlers, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to get into the techie, nerdy stuff. But, you know, advertising obviously costs money. But email, email is that beautiful thing that allows you to reach out to people that not only have already shown interest, but also 
people you don't have to pay every time you want to speak to. Granted, it costs monthly to have an email client like MailChimp or Active Campaign. Granted, you have to put work and effort into building your list. But as opposed to, uh, say, paid advertising, like if you were to buy ads on Facebook, even though I could use my tracking code that I planted on my website that, you know, pixeled, or we call it pixel, basically attached a piece of tracking code to the person's browser and now follows that browser around the web and I could show them advertising. Advertising is known to have a lot smaller of a conversion rate, meaning that advertising itself can't turn more people into buyers than, say, email lists and, the you know, using your email properly can. So if you send out an email blast, you have a much greater chance of turning people from just readers into actual buyers. And so it's very important to make sure that your email list not only gets properly maintained, but it also allows you to offer your clients additional value that kind of makes them feel special because they're on your list. And so your list are people that care about you. Your list are people that are interested in what you're doing. Those are the people that you're going to have an easier and much, much easier time than advertising or search to convert into actual buyers because ultimately guys that's what we're here to do i don't care what you do for a living i don't care if you're a rapper or a producer or whatever we're here to please our customers and if our customer is pleased they'll come back and they'll give us money if you make a customer feel special because they've been loyal to you and they've been you know coming to you with business and making you money and you make them feel like something that they've done puts them above all else and all others. And now you could actually make that person feel like, oh, you know, well, I bought his single or I bought whatever. And now I have access to stuff that the people that are just looking at his site don't. Makes people feel special because everybody wants to be a VIP, you know, so make people feel special. So again, guys, I want to kind of wrap up this episode and, and hope that I've provided you guys enough gems today to kind of make you feel a little more confident about doing your music marketing because this is what it's all about in the business is marketing your, yourself and your company and you know and letting the product kind of speak for itself at that point because I don't believe in selling product I believe in selling yourself and selling you know your company and making people actually fall in love with you and when they do you don't have to sell on the product because people who love you care about you and people who care about you don't want to do you wrong or steal from you or else they don't care about you so you trust inherently the people who care about you. So when you do business that way, people will, you know, they'll fall in love with you and they'll give you money because it, they want to see you succeed. So understand that, you know, it's super important to really take marketing seriously, especially if you're looking to be in this business and you're looking to actually make a career out of it. Make sure you take this marketing thing really seriously. Make sure you learn. And there's plenty of people that you could follow online that's fun and entertaining and you could, you know, you could actually learn something from them. Whether you like them or not, I don't really care. But, like, people like Ty Lopez and Dan Henry and and Russell Brunson and even Gary V. you know what I mean? Like, these are the people, if you study more of what they do and less of what they say in the videos, you know, you'll be able to actually start to do this stuff and see success because this is how sales are done. All sales are are the closings of a great marketing campaign because great marketing is what gets people into the building. So make sure that you're really focused on, you know, utilizing your marketing, utilizing some advertising, making sure that your, you know, your search is covered by, you know, using the right techniques to optimize your content on the web. And you will see that you'll actually start to have success trickle in and then just start coming in hard because you're, you know, you're you're doing the right things. And so this is what I'm here to do. I'm here every week trying to give you guys any gem I possibly can think of to help you guys do what you can and really make the best out of your, your music career. Because I feel like if you spend the money on equipment and you put the time and the effort to make the beat and all you do is just post it on SoundCloud or all you do is just shoot it into people's emails and, and hope to sell a, a quick beat here and there you know that's that's not exactly being in the business i want to see you guys have you know actually create wealth for yourself by building your catalog and you know and using the right tools that are available to all of us now because the internet's 
right here. You know, as long as you could hear this podcast, you have the internet, you have the tools right in front of you. Make sure you use them correctly. All right, guys. So again, I'm Brennan Lunen at EQ Productions. That's E C U E P R O D U C T I O N S. That's EQProductions.com. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at EQ Productions with S on the end. I do consultations. Um, I also do website design and pretty much anything in the digital marketing slash design world I could get done for you if you need logos. I have every means and which ways that I could actually get that accomplished for you. So, But I really love working with people. My favorite thing really to do is to work with people, kind of showing them how to use Facebook and helping them understand Facebook ads. So, again, I do a, a couple-hour consultation slash kind of an educational course where I sit with you and I take over your screen and I start designing the campaign for you right in front of you so you could watch me design it right then and there. And it's yours. And you keep it and you could run it and you could duplicate it and you could edit it and do whatever you want with it. Um, but, you know, again, I, I do that. And you could go right to my website at www.eqproductions.com and you can schedule these consultations right there. You can see the book, uh, book me now in the main menu. So definitely check that out. This podcast is out every Thursday morning. I usually try to launch it, you know, Wednesday night, Thursday morning around midnight. So look out for episode nine coming next Thursday. This is episode eight. I really appreciate you guys tuning in with me every week and checking out my content. I, you know, I hope you like my content. I hope that you guys, you know, if I should do any specific topic that you may want to learn or hear about. I've been doing this a long time. You know, I hope I could actually help you guys with, you know, these small hurdles that there really are. They're small, but they seem like there's a lot of them. So a lot of people kind of lump them all together into like one big mountain. But they're just small hurdles, man. You're doing one thing at a time, and you fix this today and tomorrow, you get something else done. If you always put in at least an hour or two a day towards what you love, you'll see that at the end of the month, you put 30 hours in. And, you know, it's a pretty good amount of time to do anything. So if you have any questions, again, EQ Productions on all social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or eqproductions.com. Anytime you have a question, you could just shoot me a quick email through the form. And I will talk to you guys next week.